I got to share some of my lunch with uh, Dr. Hal Bison, and the information that she has is so important for all of us to hear. Now, I'll give you the, the really abbreviated um, overview of her. She is uh, a neuromuscular skeletal and osteopathic manual medicine physician. That's a mouthful. You need to say that a few times. She's also uh, board certified in emergency medicine and in sports medicine. And then there's a whole lot of other things. You can read that online. She's going to uh, discuss with us today her integrative approach to patient health that focuses on exercise, nutrition, movement, mental health, and lifestyle to balance the mind, body, and spirit. Sounds like a lot. It's actually very simple the way she puts it. Please welcome Dr. Hal Bison. Good afternoon. All right, I hope I have some good luck with this pointer. So thank you, Professor Lynn. I have to tell you, I think that is the absolute best thing I could follow to get out a little pre-talk jitters, doing some Tai Chi. Everyone else is digesting their lunch now quite well, I take it. So I'm here to kind of introduce a little bit more about what osteopathic medicine is. Um, has anyone ever seen a DO before? Oh, okay, great, quite a few hands. Does anyone know what the difference between a DO and an MD is, besides different initials? Okay, so we'll touch base on it a little bit. So obviously I kind of have this trifecta of different areas of medicine that I practice. Um, and then even though they're at complete different um, ends of the spectrum, as far as true emergencies to being in more of an ambulatory care setting where I'm looking at elective injuries, they all go together. Um, and without my experience on one, I don't think I'd have keen insight in how to treat um, the patient on the other end of the spectrum. So um, one of the reasons that I went into medicine and I feel truly appreciative of exercise and sports in particular is that when I was 12 years old, I weighed 160 pounds. Um, I was pre-diabetic. I was pretty miserable. I came from um, a family with divorced parents. And so I truly owe my existence and my health to getting involved with a couple of different sports when I was in high school. And it changed my life. Um, I remember going to one of my physicians and she basically said, you know what? you're kind of fat. You actually need to lose some weight. And I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> Tell me something I didn't know. Um, but she didn't really give me any tools <laughs> of what can I do and what does good health actually mean? Does it mean the absence of disease or does it mean feeling great when you get up and having energy and having good relationships with your family and your friends and longevity, but true wellness? Um, and so this kind of led me down this pathway of where do I want to go with my career that I can start to influence other people to take their own health into their own hands and really strive for not just absence of disease, but true wellness. Um, so, whoops, so we're going to talk a little bit about what osteopathic medicine is. So this is A.T. Still. He was originally an allopath or an MD and then started to do a little bit of thinking. And he was living, the, keep in mind, 1828 to 1917. He was living in a time where there weren't a lot of options for medicine. And in fact, he lost a couple of his children to bacterial meningitis. This was at a time that if you had to undergo surgery, you were pretty much toast, okay? They didn't have good anesthesia to begin with. And oftentimes, they were already too compromised that they were going to die on the table. So he started looking at what are other options and what is innate about the human body. So he started coming up, oops, possessed, possessed, okay, um, about the core tenets of osteopathic medicine. So he realized that the body was this trilogy of an integrated unit based on the mind, the body, and the spirit. And so that's what really encompasses wellness when we start talking about it. He also started making some observations that the body has an innate ability to heal itself if it's given the right setup. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what is the right setup. Um, and then he also noticed that structure and function are reciprocally interrelated. Okay? 
So clearly, if one of those things is off balance, it's affecting more than just one part of the body. So what he started to notice is that the musculoskeletal system um, really displays a lot of the other components of the body, okay? So as you know that heart problems often manifest as more than just chest pain. Sometimes they can be that subtle jaw pain or that ache in between the back of the, the shoulder blades. Um, but he also noticed this ability that if you treat the musculoskeletal system, a lot of times you can get the ba body back into a homeostasis and you can avoid a lot of the pharmaceuticals that our uh, nation has come to love so dearly, as well as surgery. All right. So just to highlight a couple of the training differences, go through some of the basics here between allopaths and osteopaths. All right. So um, we both go through four years of undergrad. I went to U of M, go blue. Um, and then we uh, go to medical school. And I went to Michigan State, go green, okay? I've got a couple of days that are really tough during the year for me, those football days. Um, and then afterwards, we go between one and eight years of training from internship through residency to fellowships if we choose to do so. Um, we're both fully licensed to practice a variety of medical specialties and surgical subspecialties. Within all 50 seats, we prescribe medications alike. Uh, the unique, th and unique thing about osteopaths is that we have additional training in the musculoskeletal system. So we call it osteopathic manipulative medicine or manipulative treatment or therapy, or I usually just say OMM or OMT because it's a lot less easy or easier. So we've got 500 hours extra in that. Um, so oftentimes people call us fancy chiropractors. So I think it's important to go through and kind of differentiate a little bit about the different treatment modalities we use and what our training is. Oops. Okay. Touchy. Hmm. All right. So um, doctors of chiropractic medicine um, have a four-year degree as well um, in uh, chiropractic uh, medicine. However, they don't go to post-grad training or a residency um, like allopath or osteopathic physicians do. They are licensed to practice chiropractic manipulation. However, they are not allowed to prescribe medications. They don't do surgeries and the like. Um, but additionally, they also have over 500 hours of manual medicine training. Um, some of the differences in treatments are that chiropractors tend to look at the alignment of the spine to influence the rest of the body. They do utilize a fair amount of direct techniques, which is that typical kind of crunch crack um, type treatment that you might be familiar with, although they do do some soft body techniques as well. Um, osteopaths focus a little bit more on the homeostasis of the body. So I kind of look at the overall balance. And if you're coming in with arthritis, there's probably not I'm gonna, a lot I'm going to do to fix your degenerative hip. Um, but I look at how you're functioning overall. And I also really try to put an emphasis on the muscles, tendons, ligaments, everything else around the body and how it's functioning. So if you're going out and you're able to run pain-free, please go ahead. That's fine with me. Okay. Sorry, guys got a mind of its own. All right. So like I was saying before, that the way that I examine people puts a little bit more emphasis on the musculoskeletal system, in addition to a very lengthy history and physical. So um, the history that I usually do, first thing when I have people walk in the door, I want to know about their medical problems, but I also want to know about their lifestyle choices. Are you at work all day? Because oftentimes people come in and they're saying, yeah, you know, my, my back hurts after I go for a run. And I'm like, but tell me about that desk job that's soaking up 50 or 60 hours of your week, okay? Because for the most part, it's kind of the other 23 hours of the day that seem to really count, not just that one hour run you're doing. Okay, so when we start talking about musculoskeletal dysfunction, we call it somatic dysfunction. So somatic dysfunction is looking at problems or restrictions within the bones, the joints, the muscles, and the fascia. So does anyone know what fascia is? Because that's always a question. Okay, a couple hands went up, good. So what am I supposed to point at with this? Because I feel like I'm pointing at Rob. <laughs> 
I know. <laughs> okay, so fascia is connective tissue. Um, and here, anyone that's ever kind of looked at chicken, it's that glistening coating around the muscles that help them slide past each other. But more and more research is coming out on what fascia actually is, and that it actually is this neural fiber network that brings a little bit of proprioception so people know where they are in space. It brings muscle feedback and awareness to the body. So a lot of our times our treatments actually focus on the fascia um, and we can treat it and get really good results um, with musculoskeletal dysfunction. Okay, so once again, we kind of started talking about how the musculoskeletal system can influence and give us keys to other disease processes in the body. So since we're not just an arm, we're not just a foot or a migraine or any other label you want to put on it, that it affects the entire body structure. So I kind of think of it, these were my favorite nesting dolls that I found online. I really like the big Lebowski ones there. Okay, that it's a whole network going on. So it affects the circulatory system as well as, whoops, the nervous system, as well as the lymphatic system and then obviously the muscles. So let's say a shark came and took a bite out of you, okay, since we've had so many recent shark attacks, which make me want to stay out of the ocean. Um, so you end up in my ER, okay, and you've got a wound. So I'm looking inside, and obviously we can see that it's more than just muscle. It's more than just skin. We have blood vessels, veins, arteries. We've got nerves. If you went in there deep enough, you might see some lymph nodes in there. So really, it's more than just a shark bite, okay? It's affecting multiple systems at a time. So structure and function are really related. So when I start to evaluate musculoskeletal dysfunction, you can see, whoops, how things like these musculoskeletal complaints over a long time can lead to problems like this. So here you can see thenar eminence wasting here due to probably long-term ergonomic dysfunction. Okay, the person that's you know on a typewriter all day long. Um, and that over time gets wasting in the median nerve and can have muscle wasting as well. Changes like this, venous stasis dermatitis, so you're gonna see some compromise to the circulatory system as well. And sometimes this is how they complain, you know, this is their chief complaint, and I'll see it in the ER, I'll see it in my private practice as well, but then the key is going back and figuring out, well, where did it come from and why? So let's stop just putting a bandage on it or giving them a pill or treating the problem, but let's actually start looking at the cause of it. How about this? Ever seen anyone walk around like this? It looks kind of uncomfortable, okay? So lymphedema and how it can relate to the musculoskeletal system. Or how about Bell palsy, okay, where that uh, seventh cranial nerve exits the skull? So um, I've seen people that, you know, actually you go back and you start talking to them and they're saying, you know, I fell asleep on the couch in a really weird position last night. And I woke up like this the next day. And oftentimes we can treat them with a little manual medicine and work on the restrictions in the head and neck muscles and it goes away. It works a little bit better than the antivirals and steroids we used to put people on. So it's all based on anatomy and physiology. So when I examine people, I am looking at things like poor posture, who can identify with this guy over here, <laughs> okay? Pain from a prior injury, asymmetry, so the golfers in the room, the, the racket sports people know all about that, where all of a sudden you're going, oh wow, I can turn one way more than the other, or just plain inactivity. You can't see the rest of this guy, but you see what you need to see, okay? So your basic couch potato. <coughs> So the things that I evaluate when I'm actually doing a physical exam on someone, the lost art of actually putting your hands on a patient. Do you guys remember the last time that your physician actually examined you like with more than the stethoscope or more than a CAT scan? So the lost art of actually touching skin and seeing what it feels like. Does it feel boggy? Does it feel hot? Um, does it feel moist? What kind of clues can you get to underlying dysfunction? What happens after a chronic injury? Have you ever seen anyone look like this, where all of a sudden they get so much wasting in their muscle tissue, that now they have what we call a winging scapula, okay? It can be from repetitive motion um, and inactivity that way. Or asymmetry. I'm not gonna comment on why she's so muscular, 
but she probably has asymmetry from hitting more forehands than backhands. So for me, I always like to start with the feet. So go ahead, even though the lights are off, and take a peek at your shoes and see what your wear pattern looks like. So oftentimes this can be really subtle clues, okay? Um, so are you a supernator? Are you walking on the outside edges of your feet? You have a normal wear pattern, which I rarely see, but probably because I have most people coming in with a lot of musculoskeletal complaints. Or are you an overpronator, okay, where you tend to lose your arch or it flattens out as you start to walk? Okay, so once again, just kind of looking from the back, these are some of the subtle things that I always have all of my patients walk at the beginning of their physical exam, or I try to catch them when they're not looking so I can see what it really looks like. So, and sometimes with my practice, I'll recommend an arch support, okay? No, nothing that costs three or $400. I don't think that's really appropriate, but just a basic support to see if it makes a difference and can help with musculoskeletal imbalance. So once again, like I said, it can be a clue to other things going on, whether it's um, a muscle imbalance like glute meds weakness. Sometimes things like overpronation can lead to IT band syndrome, knee pain, shin splints, the famous bunion, I must have gotten it from my grandma comment. No, most of the time it's biomechanical issues going on that give us bunions. Um, plantar fasciitis or other calluses. So the other thing is muscle testing. So go ahead and stand up for a second. So one of the big bad evils that I always see in sports medicine is glute meds, which is your side butt muscle. And this is one of my favorite tests to do with patients because most of the time they're like, no, 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 I run all the time. This isn't the cause of it. I'm in great shape. I run 50 miles a week. So go ahead and I want you to stand on your right foot and I want you to try to do a one-legged squat and I want to see how great your balance is or if you feel that knee starting to wobble in or if you feel your pelvis kind of shift a little bit. And then I want you to go ahead and try to do it on your left foot. So it's a little bit harder than you might think. And that glute med is one of the biggest pelvic stabilizers that can result in muscle imbalance where all of a sudden people will say, my knee hurts on that side, my ankle, I'm getting plantar fasciitis on that side. And sometimes it can be that guy that does it. Okay, you guys can go ahead and sit down. So I do a lot of other muscle testing to see where there's asymmetry, the restrictions, the tight muscles, to kind of give me clues to what the underlying problem is. So the other thing I look for is restriction in motion, which we'll go over. So go ahead and I want you to just try to bring one hand behind your back and see how far that goes. And then go ahead and try it with the other. Is there a difference? Yes. <laughs> yes. So this can lead to tip-offs in muscle imbalance as well. And I think it's also worthwhile to note that sometimes initially people will say, man, it really hurts when I move my head to the right or the left. But sometimes after a while, the pain is actually gone. The initial injury is gone, but the restriction in motion is still there. So it's something that we just look for in a physical exam. And then obviously, last but not least, the things that I always hear walking in the door are just um, plain tenderness. Where does it hurt? <laughs> okay. So a little bit more about OMM. So this is one of the biggest tricks I've got up my sleeve to treat people from a non-pharmaceutical way. So the idea behind doing this is that we're restoring the basic body range of motion and trying to get pain-free range of motion, which I think is one of the biggest things. I can't tell you how often that I'll send people and refer them to maybe a physical therapist and they come back absolutely no better. And part of it that a spasmed muscle can't really do much work. So our equation for work is force through a distance, okay? And if that muscle is still spasmed and it's tight and it's restricted, it really can't accomplish any distance. So therefore, I can't send it to physical therapy to do any work. So that's where um, doing some manipulation can help actually restore the resting tone of the muscle um, down to the muscle spindle fiber when we start treating people to allow for greater range of motion, decreased pain, and then we can actually get them back stronger again and start to work on those muscle imbalances that kind of landed them there in the first place. 
So we have a couple of techniques that we use, and we kind of lumped it into two sums, even though there are many that delve into the categories, between direct or into the barrier techniques versus indirect or away from the barrier into a position of comfort. Most of the time when I'm treating people with OMM and they're initially in a back spasm or they're having a frozen shoulder, or they're really hurting, I like to use a lot of indirect techniques, okay? So contrary to popular belief, the no pain, no gain theory is kind of out the window in my office, okay? So I believe that pain is a pretty good reminder to people to stop doing whatever dysfunctional thing that you're doing. Um, I used to believe in the foam roll roller, I admit, but then finally I had enough people coming back and saying, you know what? I've done this, I don't feel a ton of relief. I might initially, but the pain's back the next day. My IT band is killing. I've never seen more grown men cry <laughs> when using um, a foam roller on their IT band. So I kind of started thinking about it. So what other ways could I treat this? And in fact, I kind of developed the kill it with kindness met method, which works pretty well for a lot of these things. So I'll start, start to position people into positions of ease and allow the muscle to calm down that way. So we're gonna actually do a little demo here um, using a technique called muscle energy. This is a direct and an indirect technique, but what it utilizes is the body's pairing of muscles from an agonist and antagonistic perspective. So when we start looking at this chart here, um, you'll notice that when you go to the gym, you lift what? Pecs, you lift back muscles, you do quads, you do hams, you do biceps, triceps. So we're working off this reciprocal integration model here. Um, and if anyone's ever done yoga, and one of the things that they'll tell you to do when you're supposed to be bending over to stretch out your hamstrings, they'll say, pretend you're lifting your kneecaps, which is a fancy way of saying fire your quads, okay? So if your quads are completely engaged, those hamstrings are gonna reflexively start to relax so you can get more of a stretch to them. So we can utilize this technique to start to relax muscles that are in spasm. So once again, we show our pairings of muscles. So we're gonna work with some of the neck muscles today since most people have problems in that region. So I'm gonna have you go ahead and try it. So I want you to go ahead and turn your head to the right and then turn your head to the left and see which one has a little bit more of restriction in motion. So determine which way it likes to go and which way it doesn't like to go. And for those of you that are saying, how did I ever drive here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Most people I'm like, oh, thank goodness, you're going home before me. So, <laughs> all right, so what I'm gonna have you do is turn your head into the barrier or the way that it doesn't want to go. And so then we're gonna apply a force against it, and we're working this muscle, the sternocleidomastoid, or SCM. So I'm gonna have you turn your head into the barrier, gently apply a hand on the jaw, and I'm gonna have you fire those muscles against your fingers. So, and then I want you to take a nice deep breath in and relax your fingers, and then see if you can turn your head any farther. And I'm gonna have you try it again. So gently bring your head to the new barrier and fire against it. And take a deep breath in and relax and see if you can get your head any farther. So this is actually how the Exorcist movie was taped. I'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> so you'll notice that your range of motion is a little bit improved that way too. So what other types of things do I treat with OMT? Well, the list goes on and on and on. So I kind of liken myself a little bit to House MD is that I'm like, send me the stuff that no one else can figure out because usually there's an interesting musculoskeletal component to it that goes along. So I've treated people that have chronic UTIs that end up having pelvic floor dysfunction, tennis elbow, I see concussions a fair amount in my practice because oftentimes people forget that it's not just a brain injury, but it's all the muscles of the head, the neck, the face, the eyes that become involved as well, and those deserve special attention as well. Keeping in mind that what underlies all of these muscles, nerves, lymph, arterial and venous flow, so all of these structures are also important when looking at the person as a whole. So the other things that I focus on, because people are not just one big muscle, uh, we always focus on the other things that are really, really important. So 70% of our body is water. 
So it's kind of important that we have this. <laughs> and I can tell you from an emergency medicine perspective, most of the life-threatening things that I see come in, most of the time some plain old normal saline will do the trick and at least stabilize the patient. Posture. So posture is huge. You know, now that we aren't hunting, gathering, picking berries, and, um, you know, fighting each other so much, we're in chairs all day long. So is that normal? Not really. Does anyone here think they have amazing posture? So I would say probably 90% of the things that I see, even though we do treat them with OMM, it's not a be all end all because the work actually happens away from the office. And it's the corrections that people make to their lifestyle that really make a difference. So sleep. So um, I don't really prescribe Ambien. I don't know that I think it's a long-term solution to problems. So I try to sit down and have conversations with my patients about why they can't sleep. Is it a medication that you're on that's making you pee five times a night? Because that's not normal. Okay, is it a problem with anxiety that we need to address and think of some real lifetime solutions, like deep breathing, like Tai Chi? What other things can we do to get good restoration? There's not a living thing on this planet that doesn't sleep. So why do we think that we would be exempt? So what about sunlight exposure? Who likes taking vitamin D pills? Okay, so a little bit of it's necessary. Um, how about digestion? How many people don't digest their food really well? Who needs antacids to help digest food? So looking at what is good nutrition? If it comes in a bag, box, or can, maybe you really shouldn't be putting it in your body. If you wouldn't feed it to a two-year-old, why would you put it in your body? So I'm starting to look at elimination. Do you have a normal bowel movement? Because you probably should. And most of the time, if people aren't, it's a lack of fluids in their body, another plus. Um, and what about stress management? Okay, hello, 405. This is not something that's comfortable to tolerate day in and day out. So what are you doing when you get home? And what are you doing throughout the day? So oftentimes we look at exercise. So do you go and pound out 30 to 60 minutes of elliptical in the gym? And is that really what exercise is all about? Or is it about being active throughout the day? So we talk about things like getting up out of your desk chair and moving around keeping your body moving, because this is also what stimulates the arteries, the veins, the lymph, the nerves to actually get good motion, which they all need. That's why we have joints in our body and we're not stick people. So we talk about things like nutrition, okay? So here's an example. This is Andrew Weil's anti-inflammatory diet that if I feel like people are really struggling from inflammation problems, sometimes we'll try some of these things. And then we talk a little bit about yoga and breath meditation. So this is a great three minute escape that anyone can go to the bathroom for three minutes and hide in a stall and do these types of things if you need that break from your coworkers. So a little bit more about stress management. And then this is a fun tool that sometimes I like to have people get on their phones in our world of technology. So not cacti. You uh, do not have water in you that just is a storage tank. You need to drink water and you also need to watch your posture. So this app goes off once an hour and reminds you to do both of those things. So how often do people need osteopathic um, manipulative medicine? So obviously it depends on the acuity of the situation. Um, so oftentimes for my people that are having problems like rheumatoid arthritis or they have just recently had a back injury or an ankle sprain, um, they might come in a little bit more frequently, but my goal is to teach people how to take care of themselves and how to give them the tools to empower them to take their own health into their own hands. So the last little bit is homework. So everybody gets it. It's just not grade school. So like I said, part of this is giving people the tools. So home exercise programs, nutritional counseling, and a little bit more about the neuromusculoskeletal system. So this is an example of the things that I would be giving people to do. So how do you take care of your low back? How are you supposed to sit at your computer? How are you supposed to get in and out of your bed and out of your car without tweaking your back a little bit more? So, and then oftentimes, kind of going along with that app on the phone, I'll say, here's a list of some exercises. They're just basic range of motion, okay? All I want is to get the body moving again, that throughout the day, you're taking one minute, an hour, because I think all of us are worth it to get out of your chair and move your arms, your head, your neck, your legs um, to influence motion again. So here's just another example of some things that I'll give people to do, and that's it.
And let's give Dr. Helbison a big round of applause here. Thank you.